So MPLS end to end, a realistic paradigm, that ladies and gentlemen is a question that we are going to have for our esteemed panel here tonight. So welcome everyone, I welcome every one of you to the debate on day two. It's a pleasure to see that there's a lot of you sitting here, which means there's interest in the subject. And I really encourage you to uh, participate actively. We hope it will be an interactive session where you, you know, add to the debate with your questions and, and comments. Uh, telecom services, as we all know, you know, they've been growing rapidly year after year, and the operators are running to catch up. Just as a data point, you know, in the US in 2010 and 2011, the total spending by enterprise and residential customers on telecom services exceeded the capex that the operators spent in laying out their networks. So that gives you a sense of where the operators are. And so the question before operators is, you know, how do we uh, you know, simplify our network operations and run a profitable service while you know, lowering our cost of ownership? And the challenge is, before us here is, okay, what paradigms and technologies are available to do that? And in particular, what role does MPLS have in the access and aggregation? We know it's been there in the core and, and metro, and now we bring it to the metro access aggregation segment. And how well can we do with that? That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and you know, we, we focus on that. So it's an honor for me to be here chairing this debate with this August gathering here. I thank uh, the upper side team for uh, letting me do that. Just to, be, just to let you know, my involvement in MPLS goes back to 1998. I've been involved in MPLS technology since then, and with this conference since 99. And in the last many years, my team and I at Technoia, we've had the privilege of working with small, medium, and large vendors that are looking at MPLS, IP MPLS, and carry a gear, and we've helped them design, develop, and modify that kind of gear. We've also had the privilege of working with operators in Europe, Asia, North, uh, North America, and Australia, where we've looked at Again, network strategy for the metro and the access, and what are the technology choices to, to make that happen. So jumping right into our debate, let's first start by defining you know, what we mean by end-to-end -end for the purposes of this discussion. And as I've shown you here, for us, in the wired network, we mean from DSLAM or OLT to DSLAM or OLT. And if you're talking about the wireless network, we will mean the MPLS to dominate at the metro aggregation point. So there's no MPLS to customer premise and not, no MPLS to sell side gateway. And that's just a practical reality to limit the scope of our discussion. And that's how operators are doing it by and large today. And the focus is on transport. MPLS as transport as opposed to MPLS as service, which is something that Kirti had explained in this very venue last year. And we're limiting ourselves to a uh, given operator's domain by and large uh, to keep the discussion simplified. So we have a collection of ecosystem players. You know, we have in Thomas and Christoph here, two operators of vastly different sizes. And then we have all the standard large vendors, which have both IP and PLS and Ethernet gears, Jipeng, George, Hector, and then Yapo from RAD, which does carry Ethernet gear, IP and PLS gear in the Axis and Metro. Same for MRV, which also does optical gear. And finally, we have one of the largest integrators in Arison, and we have Rajesh from Arison representing that viewpoint. So and what I hope at the end of this is that the value for the audience is we're going to be discussing several important things. And my hope is you'll take away maybe some motivations for why service providers consider MPLS end-to-end, the economics of the solutions, some trade-offs involved, the technical maturity, scalability, security. We hope to cover some of these subjects in, in the hour that we have. And the hope is that you can utilize some of the insights as inputs for your own network evolution plans or product evolution strategy. So let me kick it off by asking the question of the audience. So how many people here uh, are from the service provider? How, how, who here works for a service provider? Could you please raise your hands? Okay, that's a fair number. So now, how many out of you are currently evaluating technologies or options for your metro or access network evolution? Could you please raise your hands? All right, so I would say, you know, almost all of the people who raise their hands, at least 80% or 70% are currently looking at evolving their metro and access network. So that's great. So with that, I think the first question that we need to ask the panel is, you know, what are the motivations for an operator to even think about MPLS end-to-end -end or other technologies? And for that, I'm going to turn to Thomas and Christoph, and I'll request to maybe starting with Christoph and then with Thomas to take maybe a couple minutes each to give us the top two or three motivations that you had as you began to look at MPLS for your network end-to-end. -end. Okay. Um, when we started to look at MPLS end to end, we um, well we saw our access network and then aggregation networks, metro networks to grow constantly, and we we had scalability problems in those in those parts of our network. 
And we also started to, to sell services to our customers that, that went from one access network to the other access network. So we needed some, some, some way of combining, um, having a way to, to, to send packets from, from one network to the other without having all these, um, having to configure every single point, every single point where we go from the, from the access to the core network and back to the access network. So that's one reason why we did this. And uh, another motiv motivation for us was we saw, okay, we, we, we can run an IP and PLS network very, very well in the core. Why not extend it to, to, to the edge of the network and to, um, we, we, we have, can use our, the same tools that we were using for the backbone. And so this is one, of, one another other motivation for us. Okay, one, I'll just add that Silver Server is one of the largest ISPs in Austria, but they don't do mobile backhaul. They are dedicated to doing Ethernet services in the wireline environment, right? And, and your, your geographic yes. scope is within Austria. Yes. So that's important to keep in mind as you think about some of the discussions here. And then, of course, everybody knows Deutsche Telekom, so I don't need to introduce them. And we'll have Thomas talk a little bit about what their motivations are. Okay. I'm Thomas Beckhaus and I also did a presentation regarding the CSIS and PLS and after the last presentation on very end is that's our three vendors between Jakob and me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I'm a little bit limited with the scope of the central end because I'm still a, a normal ITN guy and I expect also MPLS down to the desktop. <laughs> Every customer should set up an MSP to Google and so on <laughs> to get it to the internet. But to be, to, to be honest, today we define our end to end it's, it's different, it's different, very different because Deutsche Telekom is very large, different requirements, we run different networks and at least in our current platform for business services, wholesale services and residential services, we now define the end-to-end -end from the access node to the access node. As I uh, presented in the presentation earlier, it does not mean that we have to add any access node to the network, but there should be most of them should be added because of the requirements. The requirements are not because MPLS provides such a wonderful quality of service functionality. Also, we are very happy with IP quality of service functionality. We also don't want to provide MPLS because of scalability, because IP scales much better than MPLS, and we have to solve a lot of scalability issues in our seamless MPLS approach. And it's, I think it's 50% of the work we have to do with the seamless MPLS approach. The main motivation, at least for Deutsche Telekom, is that we want to have one common network layer protocol in the network. We want to be sure that we can provide end-to-end -end services without configuring, configuring some nodes within the network and also consider this nodes in the network regarding redundancy, load balancing, and so on. So to move everything onto the transport level and, and services only on the service level. That's the main motivation of our network to, today to implement seamless MPLS. And it's also, this motivation is also based on our experience with our Mac and Mac based aggregation network where we have a lot of hand configuration, a lot of changes also in the network, and that means we have to configure every, every node in the network. And I think that the impact depends really on your strategy regarding single source, multi source, or multi vendor scenarios in your network. If you want to have a multi vendor scenario and very flexible multi vendor scenario, you have got a lot of problems with reconfiguring your network and any change in the network is a real mess for all the configuration. And for this task we expect to move MPLS now to the access node that we have one common network level and everything should be provided by the network level, the connectivity part of them. And we only, only have to provide the services end to end. In some cases the other end is the other access node, for example for e-line services. But in many other cases, the other end is, for, for example, a powerful label edge router implemented into the seamless MPLS, which terminates a pseudo wire and provides an IP service on top of the pseudo wire or a layer 2 service, but also the EOS functionality for our residential customers. And therefore, the main motivation for the seamless MPLS approach is to get a much better understanding, a much better possibility for operating services. And for many cases, we are also aware that we add a lot of complexity and a lot of functionality into the network, but we think it's, it's worth to implement it. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. There's three people between us, so don't be afraid. Um, yes. You know, I, I really understand your point about calling it seamless because you're saying, okay, we have uh, Ethernet being passed off, but that's at the service level. And we want a single network like MPLS in between. So we have Ethernet to MPLS and the other side, Ethernet. Yeah, that's, that's simple. 
Uh, but as I said before, there are various problems um, uh, putting the control protocols in, uh, scalability, etc. Now, if we come back a few years from now, we're going to have IPv6 interfaces on one side, IPv6 on the other. Um, are we going to have another panel on seamless IPv6, get rid of everything, and then just have one single network? Think about it. We have the control protocols. It's nice and secure. It scales. Once we get the problem of uh, doing end tries or panelists, for these giant addresses now, and that's going to happen. Remember, MPLS, the original reason, like we asked George here, was to speed up uh, forwarding, but by, by the time we got there, we, we were doing IP forwarding faster than the MPLS. That will happen with V6 also. So we're preparing the next panel for seamless V6, and that's the entire solution. I think the IPv6 seamless, and the seamless IPv6 scenario would be the best one if you only provide IP services, IPv6 services, don't have any requirements for VPN services. If you have VPN services, you need partitioning of the network. And then you have to consider what is the best solution for that. So Cisco had a short delay in getting an OC48 card out and for a moment we considered using MPLS to uh, speed it up. Um, that would work out all over the place. <laughs> and we found it very convenient to leave that rumor floating around while we get off, went off and did what we really wanted to do with it. <laughs> all right, so, so, you know, what we're really learning is that it, it depends very much on the requirements of the operators, it can vary, and, uh, you know, in different motivations. But then, I guess one other thing that still one wants to consider is the economics of doing a solution that for the metro and the edge, and clearly cost is very, very important. So now, MPLS end-to-end to end is one option, but you know, there are other options, like the Yakov talked about Ethernet and so on. I wonder what the panel thinks about you know, the trade-offs involved in, in these different solutions from a cost perspective, because really that's also an important consideration. I think that uh, up to now, most of the networks that we see eventually still using Ethernet on the other side. This is the reality. MPLS is getting more, in terms of economics, closer to the aggregation part, first aggregation, uh, first mile aggregation. Uh, but again, there is a sense, and you mentioned about scalability. Uh, it's not about only scalability of uh, the size of the dimension of uh, the network itself, but sometimes we're speaking about uh, issues like uh, the explosion of MAC addresses. And this is the issue, which means if you take any layer 2 network without the right configuration, I get shut down the network in 60 seconds. So MAC explosion is, is, is also one of the issues that we're really treating. And uh, the PVB was one of the solutions to resolve those VPLS uh, islands and not to repopulate them with all the relevant or irrelevant MAC addresses. Uh, but the fact of economics is again, today most of the Silicon, you know, the ASICs, already have the possibility to really extend the MPLS up to the DMAR device. So what we'll see is eventually a cost structure that is reasonable to extend the MPLS to the access. And the access point typically will not require a lot of multi-point configuration, it depends again on the network. But this is typically multiple of dozens connection and not necessarily supposed to learn the whole network. So the, the economics are there. If you're looking to them, the devices that can extend the MPLS to the access of the network, it's reasonable. In terms of operational efficiency, it's, it's really there, which means you can configure destination IP address of MPLS and you can, you can define it as a loose or strict path, and it's really there. So you can combine it to the relevant operation uh, uh, center and the operation processes and it's actually supposed to simplify by the configuring each node of VLANs all the way up to the first application of MPLS. So let's, let's hear Hector, I think he has a so, so I would like to mention that you know, we have multiple types of operators. We have node operators, we have incumbent operators, we have transport operators. And uh, there's no one single solution that fits all. Uh, so more specifically for the incumbent operators like uh, Dutch Telecom, uh, today there is a benefit, a benefit in doing, for example, uh, bringing MPLS directly up to the service node. So talking about the seamless MPLS approach. Uh, because today it is about provisioning two nodes. It is very well understood that you need to be provisioning two nodes every time. And as well about how about the resiliency of these schemes. So by simplifying this interconnection, putting MPLS, it brings a lot of benefits from the optics perspective. Now we can extend it as well for the other areas on the axis. Yet uh, there will be other operations, like for example, if we go into the mobile operator space, and more specifically for mobile backup, 
In many cases, there will be administrative domains uh, that even if the technology allows to have this interconnection and seamless and peerless connectivity just for the administrative, administrative domain, it's not possible. But there is a lot of benefits from the office perspective. Actually, um, we, we, we took a bit of a different approach when we, uh, when we extended the, our MPLS to, 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 to the end of the, of the network uh, because uh, we didn't want to replace our distance because um, this, is, this, is, this might be quite, quite expensive to replace um, equipment that's already there and does its job. its job. So what we did is we were, we just collocated small switches just in front uh, of the distance of the end or, or the end sense. That's because we said putting put in this functionality to the distance, but this could be quite expensive because you have all these DSL ports there and you want to use them. Yeah, I'd like to add a, you know, as a data, we may post uh, this lens and uh, no, 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 we got a lot of opportunity no, 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 to talk to operators, including Thomas. Um, we see that one of the main motivation for series NPS uh, comes from the need to quickly provision a service uh, end to end. Because I think in the past, for example, if you have Ethernet, etc., then natural, and then you know, backbone, you know, backbone is on the NPS domain, natural may be on a different NPS domain, and then you know, access is Ethernet. So as a result, it caused the service provision to become slow. Um, therefore, you know, uh, some operator decided to introduce NPS end to end so that you can take advantage of the signaling capability of NPS to set up the LSP end to end. So, but when we look at the, say that in the existing paradigm, when that one has its NPS domain, natural has its NPS domain, and uh, access is Ethernet, actually, you know, just because of this doesn't mean that the service provision may need to be slow. I think that this has a lot to do with the, for example, the IT, etc., and the network architecture. So what I want to say here is that seamless NPLS is one way to expedite service provision, but there are definitely other alternatives. So from, I think from this perspective, the, the, whether you need an NPS all the way to the DSLAN or not, uh, I think it's not entirely clear. But I do agree with one point that Hector just said, is that you know, no solution fit all, and then in different scenario, there may be also different requirements. Because I think that one thing is fairly clear is that if we think of the cell side gateway as uh, a device similar to the access, then NGOS is indeed a map. So. Uh, just, just one question I'd like to ask Thomas uh, on this video. We, we spoke about this before. Even if it is NPLS in this access portion and NPLS later on, many times, uh, many times I, I, I've seen these networks, it's either two different operators or at least two different business units. Uh, and you can't just put it all together because one operator doesn't want the other one to see its internal topology, etc. So, do you still think it makes sense uh, in that kind of situation to try to stitch it all together? Or perhaps we should do single wires for stitching or need more Ethernet? Or? I think if you really want to get all opportunities from the series and the you also have to consider the organizational aspect of your company. But if you have this split, then you get. I think we have, we have also considered um, switch PE, CBUA uh, um, via switching in the network, but that includes a lot, lot of additional requirements. What about service, what about redundancy, what about switch over, and so on. And the goal was to have one common aggregation, um, one common network for that, but also the organizational change in our company. Uh, um, in, in, the, in the past, there wasn't any communication between our aggregation people and the backbone people because there was a BIOS between them and they don't have to talk with each other. Both operator and the less networks, but they didn't talk with each other because there was no need. And this was a, also a huge part of the project to integrate all the operational people from them. But I think that's a very important point that probably is worth noting, which is that you decided to make an organizational change, I mean, and that's what is facilitating the technological change. In the absence of that, I mean, there are organizations where the groups are very different and it's very difficult to integrate this kind of thinking. I think that's important. John? So, uh, a couple points. Um, one is, 
it, it's very important to reduce the number of touch points in a network for provisioning, not only because um, you know it takes more work to provision multiple touch points, but when you have touch points in the middle, then you have to worry about redundancy at that point. Um, so, so that you know, it's not just a matter of preparing more things, but it's a matter of how you support that function. And this middle thing that's doing the stitching goes away. Um, so, uh, you know, end to end seamless is very, very good. Now, um, Yankov brought up two points. Was one is you're going inter provider. Well, at inter provider, you often want to go back up to the service level so you can measure the SLA across your network versus the other. Network. So, so you have a different motivation for going all the way up to the service level and having the extra touch points, and um, you know, and it, it eliminates some possible security um, issues as well because you can filter exactly on the levels coming across and, and know what you're dealing with. Um, the other point I want to make is, is if you have a situation where you have multiple domains within a single provider and they don't get along. Well, the architecture that I was presenting this afternoon is a way that one service could tunnel through a core that you know they don't particularly get along with, but can separate it across the UNI, and then you can build this multiple tunnels across everything on your ICP. Jeff, we just the service, the, mic here, so I think the service network good. begins to look like a single entity, and now you can just uh, provision and tune endpoints and. It does appeal to uh, logic that uh, the operators use the same common set of management tools and uh, monitoring tools that they are used to for managing a larger part of the network. That that would directly result in uh, operational uh, expenditure uh, optimization. And so, from uh, an economics point of view, that does seem to be uh, logically a better uh, way to go. There is another uh, aspect as well. How uh, the uh, uh, traffic engineering, which uh, in NPLS has been used for a uh, way, that is uh, uh, the, the operators have been uh, quite familiar with the traffic engineering techniques uh, with NPLS. And that directly uh, translates into better uh, utilization of the network capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would again, ultimately translate into better economics as well. But I, I, I do have a point that I want to bring up. I mean, we will all be talking about the fact that, yeah, it simplifies everything and it all looks good. But then what about the, there is still an operational cost. One, it, I mean, we are working with the assumption one that the operator is already extending MPLS outwards. That's the case of the operators here. What about operators that are not necessarily doing that? You know, that's, that's a challenge uh, as well. And even if you are, you know, you still have to provision many endpoints with NPLS. There are trade-offs involved in maybe I I you not just shifting the complexity from the network to the provisioning. I think it's uh, all everything is end up in the size of the network. Uh, because if it's a small network, uh, small network in terms of city care, so probably extension of MPLS will be very pragmatic. Very large network when you have a lot of install base or you have already demarcation devices that capable just upgrading the software and having this functionality or you're going to chapter 11 code. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the fact. So gradually when new projects will go to the reality and you will see that extension will be pragmatic in terms of design and also implementation, this is something that definitely will take probably more than 10 years in the reality. Today, economically, again, it's, it, it's, can, it's something that is viable, especially when working on the small operators. For very large networks, I believe that it will not pass the management uh, part of and the company. Thomas? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard task to put it really on, on the street for that. And I think it looks, will also be a very long curve to start with, to go, to go up in the, in, the, in the field for that. Okay, at this point, I mean, I have multiple questions going through my head. I'm assuming there's audience members who have some questions going through their head. So if there, Questions that the audience wants to shoot at the, at the panel, I think this would be a good time to get that process started. So, if there's something in the audience who has something they'd like to ask the panelists, I think please come up, please raise your hand. Uh, things that have been bubbling through your head as you heard the presentations the, the entire day today and what you've heard so far. 
Okay, you have a question there. Mm -hmm. of different devices, smaller devices actually for smaller pots, uh, and you may run some, some ETOP problems because LDP isn't LDP, so there is, there, you can be pretty sure that if you, you put in just, just devices from the same vendor, it will, it will just, just work, but if you have a device from vendor A and device from vendor B, they might, in some cases, don't not react in the way you like. So there are interoperability issues, and you, in, especially when installed in the network, the new network, you you will run into those. No, also, I, I think we should further and further out to the access. You know, the variety of devices will go up. And in the core, or even in the large metro core, you know, you can have a single set of devices, but in the access, that is certainly not the case. Yeah, and I think the UI, uh, and I spoke about it in my slides that just before it. Um, that the interop issue is really, really important. Perhaps um, I'm looking from a different point of view in some of the larger vendors, but I have to talk to everybody. I can't assume that there's going to be a network based only on my devices. Maybe some other people can do that. <laughs> um, and once you get out further and these devices are getting small and inexpensive, then you really can't beat things that are out there like Ethernet, which I've tested over and over again. Now, MPLS maybe in principle um, can be simpler in many ways, but this interrupt thing will just kill you. Well, I think uh, we come back to the early stage of IPPLS, and we have interoperability issues, but we have been solving this out. So we're talking about a new technology just emerging, evolving, not yet implemented in many areas, but that will be solved, so that shouldn't be an issue. I would like as well to bring up one point that NPLS end to end is not just about seamless NPLS, what you were saying, like uh, what about the, the other discussions. There is also NPLS TP, which has been emerging, and still people don't understand very much and do mistakes, like you were mentioning, Jacob, sorry, but you were putting like NPLS TP and signaling, putting issues on LDP signaling, where NPLS TP doesn't have LDP signaling, so there's no bad security issue from that perspective. But uh, I think the NPLS end-to-end -end as well addresses NPLS TP 
on the and some specific networks where can benefit from the transport-oriented uh, functionality that it brings. And in these cases as well, we can end up in the situation where we need to terminate and integrate MPLS to be with IP and PLS, like Telecom Italia was requesting uh, in this presentation, and many other customers who are deploying this technology will be needing to do this. Just one point on that. Uh, of course, uh, TP doesn't mandate a control protocol, but you're allowed to use one. And yes, the one that people are looking at is uh, GMPLS based, but uh, you know we heard the talk just before uh, from Thomas. And yeah, I think uh, when it goes into the access, we are, nobody's thinking about GMPLS to the access, probably, because you mentioned the cost and that there is some other areas. But it is visible, but at this point in time, in terms of security, just to, to highlight this point. But they, they might consider LDP. Yeah. For, for, for single yeah. for, for, for a setup of a, of a single wire across the TP. Yeah. I personally think that you know, no matter you use TP or MPLS, for a seamless MPLS, from my perspective, it may not make much of a difference. Because I think that one of the big differences people talk about TP uh, MPLS is that oh in TP maybe I don't use a dynamic control plane, but if you don't use a dynamic control plane, then you know the benefit of like have this end to end signal being kind of go away. So to some extent, uh, for TP you cannot have both. You know you cannot say that on the one hand you know I make it very simple and on the other I also want to get the damage. Yeah, but that goes back to the earlier point which I was saying that uh, are we just you know juggling balls and shifting the complexity to the provisioning system, especially when you take it all to the access, you have ten thousand devices now that need to know even if, if they do LDP downstream on demand signaling and you still got to go provision that. But I think that's a general battle between TP and NPLS. Is there a control plane good or is it even? <laughs> and, and, and let's come back to the to the, to the operational topic. I, I really see the, 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 the requirements that we get more more um, more support also from the industry. I think ten years ago, fifteen years ago, that was the, uh, the, the time was very simple. There was Cisco and Cisco implemented text switching, and then there was a digital sort of, um, vendor for that. And I think it was a hard work to do interoperability. We did it as a service provider did a lot of work in lab, lab testing and then the ITF and so on. And I think this does not work today with our access nodes, with multiple access nodes, different vendors, and most of the vendors are focusing on the DSL part or the GPON part. And um, I would expect more, many of them buy some, some software to implement on the access nodes, they don't implement the software by itself. And I would expect that we need some support from the industry for form or something else to get one implementation statement, what is the functionality of the access node to attach it to the network, to provide a, a small set of, or a minimum set of MPLS capabilities to have really the seamless MPLS to be one. That's, that's fantastic input. I think that's something that, that just the, want to mention the that ecosystem needs to know. MPLS to be able to able or not able, it depends uh, on the uh, I don't think so. I think that there are multiple operators and, that technology exists and uh, is required for specific applications. It might not be applied for your network for backwarding traffic from distance, and I agree with that. I mean, I have no issue with that. Uh, but I think it does exist in other areas. And uh, just uh, doing some, uh, talking with some analysts, uh, what I found interesting is that over the next three years, we are seeing, in terms of the packet technologies being used at the access, there's going to be 30% of IP and PLS, 30% of MPLS TP, and 30% about Ethernet. Uh, talking about, for example, a lot of uh, VSLANs, but there are other uh, access networks that we have, for example, microbit networks for backhauling mobile traffic. And in this case today, that's, that's Ethernet, and will remain Ethernet for a while. For a while. So uh, I think just, just we need to see that there are many types of operators, many types of applications, and uh, we should just think about one single solution fits all for now. I think also we need to open up again this whole discussion about MPMPLS and MPLSTP, and it started from the MPLS. I, 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 I want to focus on MPLSTP, but this specifically MPLSTP. No, because MPLS as a technology was proven which means there is no doubt. It's just a more political way to approach transport people that really don't understand the IP protocol. <laughs> this is really the truth behind the whole thing. Because eventually if you're stripping out the whole signaling, as you said, 
if you're stripping the whole good things from IPFLS, you just need the, those NMS tools like in Sonnet SDH to make it really transport oriented. So I, I think it's, and those tools are exactly what many of the operators who've been developing these for a hundred years already, they want to drop it in this new technology and make it look just like what they had before. And so they feel really good about that. If it lets us leverage MPLS, why not? I think, I mean, you're right. It's not just about the fact that they don't know IP. I think uh, it is emerging primarily from the transport domain, an optical domain, and in this area we are more specific in terms of connection-oriented environment. And, well, that's why TP was built for that. Now, it doesn't mean there is a solution for everything. And uh, so that's just putting that into perspective. Well, we talked about uh, say the complexity of moving all the provisioning out into the access, but really then what alternative are we talking about? Right? Even carrier internet requires provisioning. ELAN provisioning is a relatively involved task as well. You know, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of tools which have been developed for Ethernet that no one really uses, like GBRP and ELMI and these things. People, th these things are there. And I, I don't know, we should, they should ask the operators, why are they not being used? Apparently, you can get along without them. I would expect that we would use Ethernet in 15 years because it, it's there and nobody has implemented something else. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are mixing again uh, IP, MPLS, MPLS TP, and if we, if we do MPLS TP in the axis and, and have IP, MPLS in the core, so we don't. We don't gain, gain anything. We don't have this 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 MPLS transport throughout the network. So it's like um, who was doing the present presentation? The Italian from Italy, Italian telecom. They stitching together um, MPLS TP then IP IP MPLS and MPLS TP again with going up to the UNI and then back again going to Ethernet and then back again to MPLS. I mean. From, from our perspective, the, uh, you don't gain so much when you do that. But I think that's a difference between a large and, 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 and a smaller operator because you have an integrated operations team, they may not. And also, they still benefit, I mean, they are getting some benefit by at least having a uniform technology, even if they have to stitch it, uh, which, which it must be worth something, otherwise, there would be no incentive for them to do that. I actually would also like to put that question back again. Uh, then GVRP had to be reinvented as uh, MVRP because the protocol wouldn't scale. Right? And uh, uh, now, even with uh, MVRP, why isn't it that uh, the, uh, say it's not very popular in uh, operator networks? So is that is it just a matter of uh, evangelizing it a little bit more, or uh, I mean uh, maybe? Uh, uh, coaching more people about it, or is there uh, anything else fundamentally wrong with the uh, protocol itself? Uh, well, I think the fundamental issue is where the room of the tree has to be. <laughs> and, and a lot of people don't, didn't like that model in their networks. Actually, getting back to the internet, which is uh, like the, the whole uh, ingredients of uh, the right uh, provisioning, so MEF right now going through NMS AMS work, working group. Eventually, if it will be standard for all those relevant services and also performance measurement, and will be standard MIG that will be used by others. Eventually, it seems to be that some points will go to Ethernet on the access, and this is something again from the point of view of MEF is getting priority for the upcoming one and a half year. So when looking on the timeline and what will catch up, as of now, I don't see right now any option because most of the vendors are using their own proprietary MIPS and this is not really working that well. Yeah. So any questions from the audience? Uh, we had one, uh, people got some thoughts. We want to shoot at the panel. Okay, there's one here. Was there one at the back as well? Hi, I'm Eric from Ericsson. <laughs> I always see this question not from a breaker, but I'm just curious also and uh, how different vendors react to this and also operators. I mean, it's, it's easy to tell the guys, the transport guys, 
from tomorrow you're going to do IP, from tomorrow you're going to do uh, LDPs, so you're going to do pseudo wires. But that will not happen very easily. So I think what, what some of the other operators show is not to shake the organizational box too much, to keep all the employees happy. I mean, these also have a, a huge impact in your OPEX, if you put it this way. What are your views? Do you think it's easier to convince to extend the last mile to access or to bring the first mile to core? I mean, you have to do some stitching at a certain point if you don't want to shake the organization too much. Anybody want to take that? I, you saw, I mean, Thomas already prefaced everything by saying that they did make a significant organizational change. This is what allowed them to move forward with a plan like that. But yeah, you're quite right. I mean, that's one of the questions that often will come up. You know, if you don't want to face the organization, uh, let's hear what the panelists have to say about it. They have an opinion. It's coming back again to the right. Who are the people you're talking to? If it's a transmission department or, or it's a data department? And in some organizations, uh, at least going to some process of converging those two departments to one. And the question would be who will control this department? Whether the IP data guys or transmission guys? So it's very much uh, depends on what would happen in those uh, larger organizations. I mean, there, there are two different cultural mindsets that have existed for um, as long as IP has been around, the uh, transport mindset has existed much longer than that. And, and, you know, it's going to take a very slow process for things to change unless, you know, somebody high up the corporate chain mandates it. Um, and, uh, you, know, um, you know, Cisco positions itself as a full service vendor and, and, you know, we'll sell you whatever you want to buy. Um, but uh, there, there are certain architectures that, that we believe will win out in the end. Um, and I think the economics for conversion transport and uh, packet are, um, will be, become compelling at some point in time. People will look at those organizations and say, you know, these, these organizations are doing, starting to do very similar things and, and having separate organizations is also adding a lot of operational costs. I'd like to add that like other panelists say, you know, after the department, even if the department can successfully merge, um, after the department would merge, depending on whether the IP guy, you know, uh, take the charge or the transport guy take the charge, NPOS may be, you know, uh, preferred or not. But, you know, if you use Ethernet, pretty much everybody can accept that. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. In fact, I, mean, I, have a, I have a data point, and if you can tell us, they, they have been a proponent of Ethernet from 1995, and, and the, the CEO was seen talking recently, and he said that they found that from a cost of big perspective, Ethernet has actually been outpacing every other technology there is. So they have stuck to Ethernet in the access and metro, and they have a standard IP and TLS score, and they're very happy with it. And they find that they're able to deploy all the services today, and they do a very wide variety of services. That's an example that is completely different from Deutsche Telekom. Let's take a couple more questions from the audience because uh, we have we have about six or seven minutes, uh, maybe ten at the most to wrap up. Uh, so if there are more questions from the audience, I would love to get some more interaction. What about the operators in the audience? I mean, this question was posed to operators on the panel, but it could equally apply to the operators in the audience. Is there anybody who would want to respond to that as a thought? It's a fall of I'm so sorry? I think the episode was the dynamic of Fortnite, but it was a fall of much this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then let me, uh, let me ask uh, another question related to the, which has not yet come up, which is the OAM aspect. I mean, when we put MPLS to the access, you know, what are we going to do for OAM? You know, TP has one set of OAMs. If you're not really using TP, if you're doing seamless MPLS, then what are the OAM options? Uh, could you comment on that? What are the opinions of the panelists? I think it's important to know the status of the network and that's the reason for the OAM. You have to check the, is, is the connectivity there, is the customer, customer satisfied to meet the, the performance management and so on. 
and therefore I think the OM has a, has a goal. It, it isn't that, it's not there because it, it should be there. It has a goal, so OM has to be assessed on the, on the requirements. And for our understanding, the NPLS is it's very mature for, for some functionalities in the OM, but I think there's also some, some room for improvement for OM capabilities, also the NPLS. Yeah, um, the only question, you know, was, uh, I guess the main question that was going on in the ITF, ITU debate on TV, um, and it was really, there's a lot of stuff out there as it is. If you're bringing pseudo wires across, of course, you have the VCV, uh, we already have several flavors there. Uh, we have under that all the IP stuff, the BFD we could do with, to begin with. Now we added another layer on top of that. Um, you know, OEM is supposed to be really, really reliable itself because you're checking the reliability of your network using it. And if we get the OEM so complex, and of course it's not just the fault stuff, you have to do the performance stuff and you have to do the performance stuff in a way that you can see if something is starting to uh, slowly go bad on you, and then you have to do the diagnostic stuff. So I, th I think that's one of the real problems is uh, we really going to come down to a minimal set that we can interoperate and check. Look at the Ethernet case, for instance. Why 1731 has lots and lots and lots of TLDs, different different uh, formats you can use. Uh, the MEF came back and said, we want to use one or two, not all the 24 or whatever it is output that they have there. Uh, and they went down to the IQ and said, if you want to use it this way, they said, no, so they defined two more. Um, so I think what we're going to have to do is, out of all these new RFCs, figure out what the minimal set is, what do people want to do, and make sure that that really works across all the platforms and gives us what we want, and they say, that's good enough. I would like to second that. In fact, uh, with the MPLS, I think uh, it is a fact that the OAM has been too complex. One indicator of that is uh, really, if you look at it, no, none of the, say, the silicon out of the box, merchant silicon, really did put uh, MPLS OAM into the chip out of the box. That's happened only after MPLS DP standardized. And so that's not true, isn't it? Yeah, right. And uh, MPLS DP really uh, borrowed that response uh, from Ethernet. And they took the same concepts, in. and it's only with Ethernet, and uh, then now uh, with MPLS EP that uh, I mean chip solutions for OAM are coming up. I will make it more complicated because probably we have also optical guys in the room. So <laughs> yeah. OAM is, is about layers. So what about photonic layer? We still have OAM on the photonic layer, and maybe if you have a photonic layer problem, you cannot detect it with. Ethernet OEM or, or, or with MPLS OEM. Sure. Now, if you're going to the Ethernet, okay, so you detected the problem on the Ethernet layer, but you have forwarding information based of the router, so you need to detect it with a different mechanism. So it's, it's a kind of holistic view of the things that need to be compound for all the layers. It looks starting from the physical layer going up, and this is unavoidable. I think we'll, if we we'll try to segment it to only one specific mechanism, it's almost impossible. No, absolutely. Can I make it even more complicated for you? Um, based on that OEM, you're going to trigger some kind of protection mechanism. Now, if you have it running on the optical layer, and you have a timer on that one, on top of that, you have the uh, Ethernet, and on top of that, you're running two layers of MPLS, and on top of that, you have IP. Each one of these has a timer, and it's going to decide some kind of protection uh, mechanism based on that, right? Yeah, I think that we have to understand also the architecture of the network, how is the implication between the layer and layer and so on. And therefore you have to know how do you operate the network, what are the, your real requirements, what is the impact between the layer 0 and the layer 1 and so on. And from my understanding, most of the problems are based because we are going packet. In the TEM scenario, it was, everything was very clear. But I see also in the NPLS scenario, we have a lot of capabilities, we are very happy for that. Was ECM, for example, ECMP, and that makes OM complicated. If you have 100 ECMP paths, uh, passes through your network and you want to monitor every of the passes and you check, is there one pass broken or something else, and 1% of the packets of a pseudo wire goes down because you use the uh, entropy flow, flow layer and so on. And it's a question what is the real requirement? Do you want to get all states on the network? How do you want to operate the network? And I think in some, uh, some cases we also have to rethink about the, the solutions for that.
think that you answer why some of the transport-oriented people prefer probably a PLSTP than the one but uh, the, the good point is that at least we got rid of a T and PLS, so at least we, we, we have one less. <laughs> No, but I, in defense of that, I think that there's one quick point I want to add, which is that you, in talking to some of the companies that I've talked to, and when you have multiple layers, you know, very often problems which are perceived to be at layer three ultimately end up being connectivity problems at layer one. So definitely you need that. The other thing is that there are now vendors that are integrating packet and optics, and they are, in fact, using the visibility of layer one to see things at layer two and layer three. We just had lunch with one such vendor that's doing a pretty good job of it. Their, their operator customer is pretty happy with that functionality. So there are vendors that are beginning to do that and as we integrate packets and optics, you know, that, that's likely to happen even more. I think there was one story when we had started our first two and a half gigabit links in, uh, in Germany. There was also the, the mismatch between the optical people and the packet people because the optical people measured, measured the link and for one minute and everything was great, no bit error rate, right? but the packet people connected their routers by that and the bit error rate or the packet loss rate was, was too bad of, of, of this wire and they go give it back, it's not, it's not good enough and they checked it again. And that was a completely mismatch between the data because everybody had lives in his own world. Yeah. Yeah. But that, uh, in 30 years it has changed. That, that could be at the same layer, by the way. Um, there was an ad hoc group of the NF um, because people don't really trust the service provider of the Ethernet. You know, in the TDM world, people knew that you would get your 2.048. No one wants to get 2.046 instead, right? But Ethernet, you don't really trust what they're saying. So what you do, you go out and buy a box. You know, there are vendors who sell boxes that you do performance management, right? Um, and you test what you're getting, and the operator's testing at the other side of the link. Now, your time intervals are not exactly lined up, etc. And you all of a sudden discover that for one second he didn't live up to his SLA, right? And so you say, okay, I want money back. And he says, no, I see it's perfect, right? Now, when you start multiplying this in different layers and mixing it together, it becomes impossible. So that's just an argument for simplification of layers, right? I mean, you just make, make them as few as possible, Ethernet over, over optics, how about that? If you make it easier, in other words, um, make it so that one combined layer with one OEM and one switching, yeah, that'd be great. Um, but I think people will, some people will say that should be MPLS directly over optics, right? That's an IP, IPMPLS over VPN. Well, we have time for one very quick question from the audience before we wrap up the show. So let's take that uh, and then uh, we'll bring this all to a close. Yes, sir. Thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, when it comes to, for example, uh, multi class traffic perspective and also from the convergence perspective, and unified performance management and performance monitoring perspective. I think this is something that we have not really discussed. So does it add any value to take away this all the way down to the edge? From the previous so you said traffic monitoring. Uh, I said from the multicast traffic perspective, uh, from the performance monitoring, uh, unified PN, when we have this layer. And then from the convergence perspective as well. Convergence uh, of layers? Foster converted like fast converters on okay. edge. So three things: fast convergence, unified management, and what was the performance, performance management. Yeah. Yeah. There was also multicast. Multicast, yes. I think we know exactly how to provide multicast in an MPLS environment. Today we do it as IP multicast because it's, it's an IP router who does a multicast application in the backbone. If you move MPLS down to the access node or if you, have, if you need Ethernet as an access node or something else, we have to identify what are the solutions. And the scenarios we have today in, in an Ethernet-based aggregation network, it's not very, 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 very comfortable with IGMP snooping and so on, or we broadcast everything down to the customer. With the MPLS environment, I think we also have to consider what are the scalability issues and so on. And I think in many, many cases, IP uh, multicast is IP based and IP multicast would be a very good solution also as an aggregation. Okay. Any other final thoughts?
So the three takeaways that I got is once we need to work more on interoperability, we need to come up with a minimal set for OAM for it to be more useful. Uh, and we also need to consider very carefully our organizational structure as well as the interaction of the different segments of our network before we are able to decide you know, which technology is, is the best. And of course, we didn't expect to have a final answer. That was not the purpose here. The purpose was to expose some of the trade-offs so that when one is looking at either equipment design or network design, one can take these inputs into account and, and come up with something that's more suited to help the operators do a better job of what they're doing. So with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists and thank all of you as well. Thank you everyone uh, for your time this evening. We'll see you next year. Michelle.